We're going to continue where we started off last time. Uh, there's a handout that I gave you over two lectures ago on acceleration of fluid masses. And um, what we've developed from all of this now is a general case of, and we have these finite fluid volumes with acceleration fields in addition to gravity. Um, one, we see that if we have horizontal acceleration, we will have a change in pressure when we move horizontally. So again, think of um, some finite fluid volume. So here we have these uh, little fish in a tank. And when you move to one direction, just like the glass of beer sliding down the bar, you see that the, uh, with the horizontal acceleration, you're deflecting the free surface now. And so now if you think of moving horizontally, from the free surface into the fluid, you're moving in a direction of increasing pressure. Likewise, if there's vertical acceleration, what we see is effectively what that vertical acceleration does is change the previous pressure distribution we had, and that was for fluid statics, P is equal to gamma H. Now, basically, if there's upwards about uh, acceleration, you're going to be increasing pressures over what normally you've had, and if you're accelerating AZ in the negative Z direction, you actually decrease pressures compared to the stacks. When we look at the total derivative of pressure, we can then combine how pressure changes in both horizontal and vertical directions. And then if we just integrated that previous line between any two points in a fluid, okay? So here's some system, it's being accelerated and it's got components AZ and AX. And so this is our new free surface. And if we move from any point one to any point two, we can look at integrating that third bullet and that would then give us the fourth bullet where the pressure difference between those two points from one to two is a function of movement in the horizontal direction movement in the vertical direction, as well as the acceleration fields in both horizontal and vertical direction. In that fifth line, sorry, fourth line, where we did the integration again, if there is no horizontal acceleration, there's no pressure change in the horizontal. And what you would see in that fourth line is, if AX goes to zero, then that entire term goes to zero. And then what we did was <clears throat> look at that fourth line and look along a contour of constant pressure, which means P1 is equal to P2, for example, just riding along the free surface. When we look at a contour of constant pressure and then solve that fourth bullet for the ZDX, that's the slope of that contour, slope of the surface, but it's also the slope of any contour of constant pressure. And that uh, slope or the contour of constant pressure is related, is related to both horizontal and vertical accelerations, as well as, of course, gravity. So that's just a wrap-up of what we've been doing in the last class and a half. Last time, we did an example of just vertical acceleration. Next example, we're going to look at horizontal acceleration. Then we'll look at both. So for example, what horizontal acceleration is necessary to incline the water surface at 10 degrees off of the horizontal. Okay, so in this case, we're trying to figure out what is the area <coughs> necessary to create this system. The original system would have had this horizontal water surface. The new system is this sloped fluid surface. Okay, so in this case, we're sending to water surface. So again, just going to the previous slide, all we have to do is find out the horizontal acceleration, which is going to give us an inclination of 10 degrees. That 10 degrees is dz dx. It's the tangent of that angle. Okay, so we employ that equation. So again, if you think of the geometry, If this is theta, 
This is dz, and that's dx. And what we're saying is, we know theta is 10 degrees. It's actually a minus 10 degrees, because we have ax in the positive x direction. <clears throat> so in this case, we're trying to solve for this. There is no AC. We're asking, what is the horizontal acceleration necessary to create this condition? And so we know what theta is, and therefore tan theta is dz dx, and therefore there's only one unknown in this equation, ax. We know the acceleration is now. So again, when we have ax positive, our coordinate axis system is always z positive upwards, x positive to the right. So when we say we're inclining at 10 degrees, we're actually looking, when we have a positive ax, we have a negative 10 degrees. Or we have a, this slope, this dz dx slope is actually a negative slope in this z x domain. So in this case, ax is uh, solving the equation with the first one. Or AX. <coughs> AX is equal to G plus AZ tan theta. And again, that negative sign does not appear below because we're saying we have a negative slope. It's already built it. We're building it in. So in this case, um, since AZ is zero, AX is G tangent of theta, 9.81 meters per second squared times tangent of theta. 10 degrees is 1.73 meters per second squared. So you have this tank of water. Did I give you the dimensions of the tank? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's a tank the size of this room or just a little cup of coffee. If you accelerate to the right, you're going to get this slope. That equation on the first bullet of this slide has no dimensions in it physical dimensions of length, width, height. It's whatever that finite volume is. You accelerate it at 1.73 meters per second in the positive x direction, you're going to get a slope of 10 degrees for that fluid volume. And every contour of constant pressure is in a slope of 10 degrees as you move through that slope. So you can, have, and we'll go through this in the next example, calculating the pressures and then forces at different so, any questions on how we did this? Um, in the second slide of today, I gave you a summary of all the equations. Whenever you have a problem where it's giving you an acceleration other than gravity, these are the equations that are applicable. And they're either asking for what's the acceleration, what's the net geometry, what's the pressure, what's the force. But it's all the same equations. It's just you're trying to isolate the uh, variable of interest in this. So I said that we had a container of water. What if the container was filled with mercury? Does the answer change? Go back to that equation and what we were asking for. What is the horizontal acceleration necessary to incline now a mercury surface to 10 degrees off the horizontal? That's the equation we used. Where are the fluid characteristics of mercury in that equation? Nowhere. So you will get this irrespective of the fluid. What will happen, though, is in the unsteady state, for example, when you first start with it static and you initially start the acceleration, for that fluid surface to actually go from 0 to 10 degrees, that's where you'll see the difference. Water may do it much faster than mercury because of viscosity. But the steady state system is in this equation and has nothing to do with what the fluid is that you're using. It has everything to do with just the acceleration field. So um, I want to talk about this first, then we're going to do a numerical example. How would you find the pressure, pressure distribution? So this was our system. Again, this is the final state and that was the initial state. So it was at rest, horizontal surface. Accelerate to the right at 1.73 meters per second squared, and you get a fluid surface of 10 degrees off the horizontal. Note the symmetry. It went up 
on the left-hand side the same distance it went down. Now that's true if you have a symmetric container. If it's not a symmetric container, that wouldn't be true. Okay, but if you consider this like a box or a rectangular uh, structure, it would go this, up the same on one side as the other. If it was a cylinder, it would do the same thing. So, <clears throat> if you wanted to know the pressures throughout the system, these, this is the pressure equation we developed. The change in pressure going from one point to another is affected by movement in the x direction and movement in the z direction. So th this is the equation that we generated by putting the two partial derivative statements for x and y pressure changes. So um, we can look at four points, for example, in this system. Point one is the upper left-hand side. Point two is directly below it on the left-hand side. Point three is the bottom of the right-hand side, and point four is on the right-hand uh, right side upper. We have a free surface. When we add this container, we accelerate it. What can you tell me about P1? It's atmospheric, right? Zero. How about P3? Zero. So we're going to use that to our advantage. Again, note the symmetry. It goes up on the left-hand side the same amount that it goes down on the right-hand side. So before we get into the mathematics, <clears throat> two fundamental different systems using the same set of equations. One is um, what they make laws about, open containers, right? You're drying with open containers. The other is if you have a closed container. The difference is, in an open container, if you accelerate it fast enough, you can actually start to lose volume. And that creates a problem when you're trying to calculate pressure distributions and forces. Okay? So I just want, I think you understand that if you accelerate it at uh, an open container high enough, you start to spill fluid out the top. <clears throat> um, the equations we develop are still relevant. They do not lose, uh, you don't, do not modify them at all. And so again, that equation we just used for the slope of the surface is still relevant whether or not you lost fluid. You're still going to have that slope to the surface. And that is what helps you to identify whether or not you lost fluid as well as how much fluid you lost and how much fluid is remaining. This is defining the system geometry. That fluid surface slope, dz dx is equal to minus ax over g plus ab, defines geometry from which you can determine everything. So again, before we have any acceleration, we have some initial volume, length times width times height, if it's a rectangular system. After we have acceleration, this is what our system looks like, and of course, if we're accelerating the other way, you know it's just going to be a mirror image. If we have z component of acceleration, it will affect the slope. So I'm just trying to simplify right now. The real issue is, when you have that acceleration, you want to figure out, did the fluid surface go over that opposite side? If it did not, you haven't lost the volume and you um, have no overtopping, and your original volume is your final volume. If you calculate from this slope that it must go at least to that point, it can never go above that point. If it goes above that point, you've lost fluid. And so this point then becomes um, Uh, a fixed location from which the tangent of theta or the, the slope occurs. So you could actually keep increasing AX and now you've lost fluid and you could keep increasing AX such that you know, you're losing more fluid and now the slope is actually riding along the bottom. But this slope is all dictated by dz dx. So 
once you have the acceleration, it dictates what this ultimate slope looks like, and it dictates whether or not you lost fluid volume. That is true for open containers. So again, you could have possible uh, overtopping with uh, excessive flow volume acceleration. Um, everything I just drew in there. Again, I'm just indicating that uh, that slope dictates all the geometry. When you've lost fluid, you don't know if you have the same um, fluid volume anymore. In a closed container, by the name closed, you're not losing fluid. Okay, and so what happens is the pressure distributions are changing, and now DZDX is identifying the contours of constant pressure, but you haven't lost any fluid. So um, this equation is describing the contours of constant pressure. Uh, in practical situations, for example, these systems are vented somehow. So you may not lose fluid, but somehow you know, you're not creating these pressure vessels where you have excessively high or low pressure. So typically, you do know some information somewhere. So in the closed containers, again, the big difference is you will not spill anything. The initial volume is preserved. And again, very often, our real engineered systems are very often vented to the atmosphere. And so what we would have, again, is this equation is, oops, is operable. And all that equation is describing is the slope of the contours of constant pressure. You can always go from one point to another point. And at point one, we have P1. At point two, we have P2. And I'll show you the equation again, but we've already integrated the equation to figure out the pressure difference from one point to another. To solve that equation, you would either need to know one or all you're after is the pressure difference. And again, I'm going to be doing an example where it talks about this. So here's that example. Here we have an open container. It's half filled with oil. And the specific gravity of the oil is 0.5. It's accelerated to the right. And that acceleration vector is 10 degrees off of the horizontal. Line. So here's our acceleration <coughs> vector and it's 10 degrees off the horizontal. And that acceleration vector is 5 foot per second squared. And so you'll see the container on the next page, but it looks something like this. It's a nice rectangular container. And so if we are accelerating to the um, If we're accelerating at 5 foot per second squared at this angle 10 degrees off the horizontal, we would expect the fluid surface to do something like this. And what we're asking is, what's the pressure distribution on the left-hand side? And what's the pressure distribution on the right-hand side? Okay, and there will be many pressure distributions. Okay. Once we know the pressure distributions, we can then calculate the force on the left-hand side, and we can calculate the force on the right-hand side. So that's what we're after in this problem. So <clears throat> here's our container. And so again, going back to the problem statement, the open container is half filled with oil. Okay, So you see that this volume is half the distance of each side. And the dimensions of the container is 5 feet high, by 20 feet in length, and it's got a width of 10 feet. So that's our container that we're moving down the road, and we're having this acceleration of five foot per second upwards and to the right. So that's our initial condition, and obviously if the system is half filled, and you have five foot of height of one side, then this distance is of course 2.5 feet. And it's oil. So 
after we accelerate, this is what we would expect. We would expect that that acceleration of five foot per second squared and 10 degrees off of horizontal is giving us a system that looks like this. And when we have the system that looks like that, again, we need to identify whether or not we spilled oil. You cannot calculate the pressures on either end and therefore the forces unless you know that you have not lost volume or you have lost volume. That geometry will work its way into the pressures on each side. So just for example, what if you accelerated it high enough that this was your final condition? What's the pressure distribution over here? It's atmospheric, right? There's no fluid on it. So that, you have to figure out whether or not, when you have an open container, whether or not you've lost fluid. So <clears throat> we don't know if this acceleration field forced us to lose fluid or not. However, we know <clears throat> that the geometry with the acceleration field is going to dictate the slope of that fluid surface. Theta is the angle off of the horizontal due to the acceleration fields AX and AZ. So what we'd like to do is calculate tan theta and then figure out if the fluid surface exceeded that left-hand side pinnacle, the, uh, top, uh, five feet, if the deflection was two and a half feet on one side, two and a half feet on the other. So the horizontal acceleration, you know, again, we've got um, an acceleration In, uh, that can be broken into components AX and AZ. AX, the horizontal component, is 5 foot per second per second in 10 degrees. And AZ would be the 5 foot per second squared sine of 10 degrees. So we have the two vector components of our acceleration field of 5 foot per second squared broken into X and Z components. And now we can calculate what the tangent of theta would be, that is the slope to the surface, so again, knowing AX and AZ, we can calculate that DZDX is minus 0.149 feet. What does that mean? Again, we have this container that's 20 foot in length. And DZDX equal to minus 0.149 feet means that if you go horizontally one foot, vertically you have lost 0.149 feet. So theta is minus 8.47 degrees, meaning from the horizontal, our surface is 8.47 degrees uh, below the horizontal uh, when we look at it this way. Okay. So now we're trying to answer the question, did we spill any fluid? Well, to figure out if we fluid spilled fluid, what we would like to do is calculate that height. We know that the height of one side is five feet. And if this was initially half full, that's 2.5 feet, which means this distance is 2.5 feet, right? And so if we calculate that distance on the left-hand side H, if it's 2.5 feet or greater, we've spilled oil, right? And so when you make this calculation using uh, the geometry of the system, you know you cannot have the fluid sitting at the left-hand side above the end. That can't happen. That's why if you calculate H to be greater than 2.5 feet, what you really have is this. The fluid goes right to that left-hand side and it just keeps spilling there until it reaches an equilibrium volume. Okay? But you still know the geometry. So we be after calculating H and what you have is a very simple right triangle. You have a 20-foot base and because of the symmetry, you have a triangle that is 10 feet by H right triangle with that angle of 8.47 degrees, right? So in this case, H is equal to L over 2 tan theta, where L is the 20-foot distance. 
for h over l over 2 is the tangent of theta. And so uh, we can put in what we know for l and theta, and that tells us that h is to 1.49 feet. And again, if, if it goes up 1.49 feet on one side, it went down by 1.49 feet on the other side. So that 1.49 feet is less than 2.5 feet. That means you have not spilled fluid. And again, if this, and you'll see this on the next slide, if this is 1.49 feet and this is 2.5 feet, then the total distance on the left-hand side is 3.99 feet. And on the right-hand side, you'd have 2.5 feet minus the 1.49 feet, or 1.01 feet on the right-hand side. So we know the geometry. So all right triangles. So this is that system I just drew for you. Um, we know we didn't spill any fluid, and so the fluid is not going to the very top. We know it went up 1.49 feet on the left-hand side, went down 1.49 feet on the right-hand side, and so we have a geometry where we have 3.99 feet of oil on the left-hand side and 1.01 feet of oil on the right-hand side. So, the first question that was posed was, what is the pressure distribution on the left-hand side and the right-hand side? Now we can answer it, now that we know we have not lost fluid. Okay, with open containers, you can't get to that question until you know whether or not we've lost fluid. So we can go from point one to point two. Point one, we know what the pressure is, it's a free surface. And we can calculate the pressure at point two. We could move over to the right-hand side, we know the pressure at point three. Again, it's still a free surface, even though it's slow. And we can calculate four. So the four with fluid statics and manometers, we can go from the free surface, for example, to any other point. And we could calculate the pressure at point two if we knew the pressure at point one. And basically, that's what we're going to use the new set of equations we have that include acceleration. We're going to start at one point, go to another, and use the fact that we have a boundary condition, that we know what the pressure is at some specific location. And what you're going to see me do is, I'm going to go from one to two. I can call this an origin. Again, all that's going to do is when I integrate the equations, P1 is going to be 0, or X1 is 0, or Z1 is 0. If that is my origin, what are the coordinates of X2, Z2? Well, the left-hand side is a vertical wall. So what's X2? 0. Right? Just going vertically downward, you aren't changing X2. And Z2, again, the oil is 3.99 feet deep on the left-hand side, and Z is positive upwards. So Z2 is minus 3.99 feet. Okay. So you're going to see these in the future uh, diagrams, but it's really no different than what we did before with fluid statics. These coordinate systems are there, but we, we boiled it down to P is equal to gamma H. That implicitly occurred from a free surface where Z was zero and pressure was zero. So we're going to compute the pressures at one, two, three, and four to get forces on each end. Once we have pressures, we can get forces. So <clears throat> we already know, as, and I described on the last slide, P1 is equal to P3 is equal to zero. They're the free surface. For the left-hand side, we're going to start at point one and go vertically downwards to point two. We let the origin for this analysis going from point one to point two on the left-hand side. We let the origin be right at the free surface. X1, Z1 is zero, zero. X1 is equal to X2 is zero because you're going from point one to point two along a vertical line. There's no change in X. 
So this was one of the equations we started with on the second slide of today. It's one of the equations we derived. And the analogy to this was for fluid statics. Whoops. That was our analogy in fluid statics. The PVC is minus gamma. So here we have the change in pressure will occur due to any changes with movement in the x and any changes with movement in the z as long as you have both ax and ac. We take that equation for dp and we integrate it between p1 and p2 and we integrate it from x1 to x2 and from z1 to z2. And what you get is the second to the last bullet. The integral of dp is p, evaluated as 0.1 and 0.2. So that's p2 minus p1. The other integrals, what you'll see is I took those negative signs, and instead of x2 minus x2 minus x1, I brought the negative sign inside, and I get x1 minus x2. So that's where the negative signs went away. And then what we know is, again, when in doubt, cancel out. The pressure at the free surface at 1 is 0. x1 judiciously selected was the origin. x2 judiciously selected to be vertically below x1, 0. z1, 0. Okay, And this is exactly what we did in fluid statics. You just don't see all these zeros floating around. We just developed it into p is equal to gamma h. And that's basically what you see here. So the last bullet just got rid of all the zeros, and P2 is the specific weight of the oil divided by acceleration due to gravity, the vertical acceleration at AZ plus gravity times a minus Z2, and Z2 is a negative number. So you have a double negative there. Yeah. Can you go over why X1 and X2 are both zero again? Sure. So this point on the upper left-hand side is X1, Z1. And this point is x2, z2. Okay, it's a vertical line. And we're going to do the same thing when we go from 3 to 4. It's, could we have selected a point right here? Absolutely. You just need to know the x, z, and pressure condition. But you're, whatever other point you pick. But I typically am kind of showing you judicious selection of points to get rid of as many terms as you can. Okay, so this last equation on this slide is the first equation on the next slide. And specific weight of oil, the specific gravity of oil times the specific weight of water. We were given that the specific gravity of the oil is 0.85. The specific weight of water is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, and that gives us specific weight of the oil of 53 pounds per cubic foot. So putting everything we know into that first equation, this is the specific weight of oil over gravity, 53 pounds per cubic foot over g. The next terms are the vertical acceleration plus gravity. We calculated AZ to be 0 0.87 foot per second squared, and gravity is 32.2 foot per second squared. The minus sign is right here. And then Z2, as we indicated, is a minus 3.99 feet. Z is equal to zero at the free surface on the left-hand side. And Z2 is the minus 3.99 feet. When you multiply that all together, you get P2 is 217 pounds per square foot. So if this is our container, pressure distribution looks like this. It goes from zero PSF pounds per square foot at the surface down to 217 pounds per square foot. <clears throat> it's a linearly changing pressure distribution. Look at this equation. Is gamma, is the specific weight changing as you move through the fluid? No. 
is the acceleration due to gravity changing as you move through the fluid? No. Is AZ moving as you move through the fluid? No. Is G? No. The only thing that's changing as you move along that left side is Z. And that's why you have a linear pressure distribution. We want to convert that into a force on the left hand side. And that's just going to be the pressure at the center of area of the area of the left hand side. How would you calculate the pressure at the center of area in a linearly changing pressure distribution? Pressure at the top plus pressure at the bottom divided by two, right? So if I looked at the end, this is what the left hand side looks like. And the fluid surface is 3.99 feet deep on the left hand side. So you have this rectangle being submerged in a fluid. Above that 3.99 feet, it's in air. Pressure on it is zero. So finding the pressure at the center of area is just the average of the pressure at the top and the bottom. Okay. And then that area would be 3.99 feet times the width, which we said was 10 feet. Not so bad, is it? So we'll calculate that on another slide. We're, we're at the doorstep of calculating the last thing we were after. First, you were asked to calculate the pressure distribution from the left and the right, and then you were asked to calculate the force on each side. Okay, so we're going to go from the left hand side to the right hand side. And on the right hand side, We've got 1.01 foot depth of oil. And we call point three and point four, respectively, the fluid surface on the right hand side. And point four was at the bottom of the fluid surface on the right hand side. say, I'm going to let that be my coordinate axis system zero. That's my origin. Okay? You can certainly use the same origin that you used before for point one. You don't have to, but if you use the left hand side upper corner as your origin, you need to now find the x and z coordinates, x3 and z3, with that being your origin. All you're doing is complicating your life. I'm telling you, when you're asking for questions about pressure distribution, you're going to have to integrate that equation uh, that's, the, that's here. You have to integrate that between two points. My suggestion to you, if you can make one of those two points on the free surface and your origin, you get rid of two terms right off the bat. You get rid of a pressure term and you get rid of a location term, say an X term or a Z term. So we're going, to call, we're going to go from point 3 to point 4. We want to find the pressure distribution on the right hand side. We already know the pressure at 3 is atmospheric, it's zero. We're going to set a new coordinate origin at the free surface on the right hand side at point 3. So x3 and z3 are zero. We're going to move vertically downwards from point 3 to point 4. So x3 and x4 are the same because you're just moving vertically. So our general equation is dt is equal to minus gamma over g a x dx, minus gamma over g a z plus g. And again, we're integrating this from points 3 to 4. So p3 to p4, x3 to x4, z3 to z4. And that gives us the equation which is the second to last bullet. P3, P4 minus P3 is everything on the right hand side. We know P3 is zero because we selected point three at a free surface. We know X3 and X4 are both zero. X3 is at the coordinate origin. 
and point four is immediately directly below it, so there was no change in x. And then we know again, since point three is the origin, that turns equal to zero. And so we're left with this equation here that looks very similar to what we did on the left-hand side, only the only the difference was subscript two instead of four, the same thing. The only difference in this equation from left to right is the z term is different. On the left-hand side, it was minus 3.99 feet. On the right-hand side, it's minus 1.01 feet. So there's that last equation. <coughs> and from this equation, um, this should be T4. I copied and pasted it. Um, so what we have is gamma over G. We already identified the specific way the oil is 53 pounds per cubic foot, divided by the acceleration due to gravity times the sum of the vertical acceleration plus gravity, the 0.87 foot per second squared, or 32.2 foot per second squared. The minus sign, again, is right there. And z4 is minus 1.01 feet, because we go from 0.3 to 0.4. And on the right-hand side now, we go from p3 equal to zero PSF, to P4 is equal to 55.1 PSF. And what we can then do we can then take that linear pressure distribution, calculate the pressure at the center of area, and then with that pressure at the center of area multiply it by the submerged area to get the force. So again, for the right-hand side, you've got something that is uh, 10 feet in the ward by five feet high. That's the full side of the side of the tank. But you only have a depth of oil of 1.01 feet. So the center of area is right here, G. Okay, so that's the area we're talking about. 10 feet by 1.01 feet, and the center of that area is half of 1.01 feet. So it's minus about feet from the top to the bottom. Okay, so uh, I was creating this just before class, and I did something, and I hit escape, and I lost all my uh, all my slides. So we're, we're going by hand right now. So um, the force on the left hand side as we just identified, is the pressure of the center of area times the area of the left-hand side. And since we know these pressures, this is going to be equal to the average, the pressure of the center of area on the left-hand side is the zero PSF at the top plus the 217 pounds per square foot at the bottom over two. That's the pressure of the center of area on the left-hand side. And the area of the left hand side is 3.99 feet times 10 feet. That's the depth of oil on the left hand side, and that's the width, 10 feet is the width. So that's equal to 4, 3, 3, and a I would actually like a commentary after today. Either tell the TAs or tell me if this is an acceptable way to go. In the future, I may do more of this and less of all these figures that you're rapidly trying to um, copy because then I have to write at the same speed as you do. So if, uh, if you can keep up with me this way better than you can keep up with me with all those pre made slides, let me know. We're after continual improvement here, and it will happen before December 10th. Uh, they like this way better. Yeah. They like this way better? Mm -hmm. Everybody's crazy. So, <coughs> so um, that's the left hand side. Now let's do the right hand side. That comment came in way too quickly, and I also know that other people will say they don't like it. I always know I cannot please everybody. So I'm just trying to please as many as I can. So I'll probably be doing mixtures for the rest of the semester. So, same thing on the right hand side. We need the pressure in the center of area times the area. On the right hand side. 
And similarly, we would get that by getting the average pressure on the right hand side times the submerged plane area of the right hand side. So this is equal to the pressure at the top, 0 PSF, that's 0.3, plus the pressure at the bottom, the 55.1 um, PSF, that's 0.4, over 2. And then the submerged area on the right hand side is the 1.01 foot of depth times the 10 foot of width. And that gives us 278 pounds. All right, since uh, you're so good at this now, let me ask a really foolish question. Where are those forces at? So let's look at the left-hand side. Here's the left-hand side. And here's the pressure distribution. What, whoops, what is the shape of that pressure distribution? What does it look like? Triangle, very good. Where is the center of area of a triangle? One third up from the base, right? Before, when we wanted to identify where forces on main submerged surfaces acted, we used this equation, YCP, the distance along the inclined axis to the center of pressure. Remember that? When you use that equation, and your surface starts at the surface, such that you have a triangular distribution, you will get YCP one third up from the base of the triangle. Complete consistency. So you know where these forces act. If this is 3.99 feet, that's the total height, the distance here is 3.99 feet over three. One third up from the base. And the screen is frozen. My screen is frozen, or this screen is frozen? It's not consistent. Oh, no, it's very good now. So, so you know where these forces are at. Uh, next foolish question I will ask. Is the left-hand side force equal to the right-hand side force? Are you the same? No. What does their difference equal? I'll help you a little bit. This is where it all started. We started with this differential cube. And instead of statics, where we said sum of forces equals zero, with acceleration fields, sum of forces is mass times acceleration. So if you actually uh, go through this, what you would see is um, MAX is the density of oil times the original volume, which you know, two and a half feet high by 20 feet long by 10 feet wide. You know the original volume. The density of the oil, we calculated the specific weight, just divide that by the acceleration of gravity, and then AX. And I will leave that up to you since I'm out of time, but what you get is um, 4,05 pound, and that's equal to F left-hand side minus F, okay, not that. I think we know this to what we cut out. Oh. Yeah, whatever we want. Okay, let's go. No, it didn't stop. Let's try this. Yeah. Is, it, is it back? No, it's back, yeah. Okay. Right-hand side is equal to 43.30 pounds on the 278 pounds, which is 405 pounds. So um, all is right with the world. I guess they cannot hear you. They cannot hear me or see me? No. They can see you, but they cannot hear you. They cannot hear me again. Okay, hold on. So, I'm out of time. Um, all I did for those of you, I can't remember, I don't know when it kicked out, but um, I just demonstrated that this is true. Uh, go ahead and pack up. I gave you a handout on continuity. 
and we're going to go uh, very quickly. I'm not going to do the derivation. I'm going to go to the operative equations for continuity. So read that handout for next time. And uh, I might give you a few problems for homework, but they won't be due until Monday. <laughs>